welcome. This is Małgorzata Szałkowska. I'm a current secretary of ITMIC and I would like to thank all of you who have joined our first webinar for thymic epithelial tumor patients in this year. Before we start, I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping rules. The meeting will be recorded and published on ITMIC webpage. If you don't wish to be recognized online, you should connect having camera off and without any identifiers. Please make sure that your microphone is muted, muted during the whole webinar. After the presentations, we will have a Q&A session. If you have a question, please submit it via the chat button at the bottom of your meeting window. Our first talk is Imaging of Thymic Tumors, and our first speaker is Dr. Chad Strange, Diagnostic Radiologist from Thoracic Radiology, University of Texas MD, Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas, USA. My name is Chad Strange. I am a thoracic radiologist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I would like to thank ITMIG for inviting me to speak briefly on imaging of thymic tumors. I have no disclosures. Over the next few minutes, we will review basic chest anatomy as it pertains to the thymus. We will discuss the common imaging modalities used in thymic imaging, the pros and cons of each, and we will review a few sample cases of each imaging modality. Finally, we will review how imaging is routinely used in thymic tumors in the clinical setting. The thymus is a small gland that is situated behind the breastbone. It normally is present in children and slowly goes away during puberty and young adulthood in most people. It is in the front of the chest in what we call the prevascular or anterior mediastinum, and it is situated between the lungs and above the heart. Because of this somewhat hidden location, imaging is important in evaluation of the thymus. Related to this hidden location, regular chest x-rays are generally not helpful in evaluating and following thymic tumors. So for this reason, as we turn to look at the imaging modalities used in thymic tumors, we will start with CT scans. Computed tomography, commonly called CT scans or CAT scans, are the most common way we image thymic tumors. When a CT scan is performed, the patient is lying on a table and slides into the donut-shaped machine. Images of the patient are obtained and displayed in slices like a loaf of bread. These images are then reviewed on a specialized computer called a PAX station. Let's talk briefly about this loaf of bread analogy. When you look from the outside, before a loaf of bread is sliced, you can't tell whether it's white bread or wheat bread or whether it has grains or raisins inside. But when you slice the loaf of bread, it's easy to see these things on the inside, and that is similar to a CT scan. Once the images are sliced or separated, it's easy to see all the different structures on the inside of the body and tell what is normal and abnormal. The CT image on the right is one slice through the chest with a large thymic mass in the front of the chest marked with an M. The round and tubular white structures are different blood vessels going to and from the heart with the aorta and the pulmonary artery labeled. These are bright white because they have intravenous or IV contrast in them. Intravenous or IV contrast is a substance that is given through a tube into the arm into one of the blood vessels called a vein that helps normal structures and tumors show up better on the CT scan. Since the mass is in the front of the chest, in front of these vessels, that's why we say it is in the anterior or prevascular mediastinum. The large black areas on each side are the lungs as labeled. The pros of CT scans are many. Most importantly, the size of thymic tumors, whether it is spread into local structures called invasion or whether or not it is spread to more distant places called metastasis can be well evaluated with CT. CT scans are quite fast, only taking a few seconds to perform, and CT scanners are widely available and when compared with other imaging modalities, such as MRI, PET-CT, which we will soon discuss, the cost is manageable. One of the cons of CT is that radiation is used to obtain the images. While new scanners and protocols have significantly reduced radiation doses in children, young women, and patients who will require repeated follow-up studies, this may still be an issue. 
because tumors, body organs, and muscles can look similar on CT, more subtle lesions can be difficult to identify, especially if IV contrast is not used. Although it is very helpful, some patients are allergic to the contrast, and it can harm the kidneys in patients that already have kidney problems. In patients where IV contrast cannot be used, more subtle areas of local or distant spread can be difficult to see. Let's look at a few examples of CT scans performed in patients with thymic tumors. The image on the left shows a patient with a large mass in the front of the chest marked with an M. This has spread into the superior vena cava, which is the main vessel that drains blood into the heart from the upper body, which is marked with a black arrow. The CT on the right is normal for comparison. If you compare the normal round vessel on the right image marked with a black arrow, you notice how thin and almost closed off the vessel is on the left image. In this case highlights the fact that thymic tumors commonly spread into structures that are close by, including blood vessels, and CT scans with contrast are generally good at seeing this local spread of tumor. Our final CT scan example shows another mass in the front of the chest marked with an M on the left image. On the right image, marked with white arrows, are small nodules that are along the pleural surface, which is the covering of the lungs. In the left image, you're now looking straight at the patient instead of slices like a loaf of bread. So in this image, the head would be at the top, the feet at the bottom, and I've labeled the lungs, heart, and liver to help orient the image. You can now see how these pleural nodules are along the bottom edge of the lungs marked with the white arrows. This covering of the lungs is a very common place for thymic tumors to spread away from the tumor called distant metastasis. While CT is generally good, at identifying these more distant areas of spread, it should be noted that sometimes these areas are flat and they cannot be seen with CT scans, especially if IV contrast is not used. We will now move to magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, which is another way to image thymic tumors. One of the pros of MRI imaging is that there is no radiation used. And this is particularly helpful in younger patients or patients who have had or will have multiple studies for follow-up. MRI is also very good at telling different things apart, what we call tissue characterization. What this means is that MRI can more easily tell the difference between tumor, regular body organs, muscles, etc., even without IV contrast, which we discussed was a limitation of CT scans done without IV contrast. For this reason, while IV contrast is helpful, even in MRI scans, to best see a tumor, they can be done without contrast if needed and still be helpful. The cons of MRI are significant, however. MRI scans are very expensive. Also, due to the high cost to purchase and maintain MRI machines, they're not always available in every location. Finally, scan times are significantly longer with, than CT, often running 45, 60 minutes. Given that MRI scans are very sensitive to motion and lying still for 45 to 60 minutes is very difficult, these studies can be demanding for some patients to perform. The provided MRI image demonstrates a thymic mass in the front of the chest marked with an M. We're now going to look at a couple of MRI example cases. On the first case, the image on the left is a CT image obtained without IV contrast due to the patient's prior allergic reaction to CT IV contrast. It demonstrates a large mass in the front of the chest marked with an M that puts pressure on the heart. The image on the right is an MRI image, which was obtained with IV contrast since most patients who are allergic to CT contrast can still get MRI contrast because they're different. Now, on this MRI image with contrast, we can see the details of the mass much better than the CT. And there are areas that are brighter white, which represent contrast enhancement marked with an E. These areas of enhancement show areas of the tumor that are more quickly growing. On the left MRI image, where the mass was putting pressure on the heart on the CT, we can now see on the MRI that this area of tumor marked with the white arrow is actually growing into the side of the heart, a part known as the right atrium, notated RA. This case highlights that MRI is very good as a problem-solving study as it shows the growth of the tumor into the heart that was not well seen on the CT scan. 
The case also highlights that MRI contrast can usually be given even when CT contrast cannot be given. Our final MRI example case highlights another specialized use of MRI. This is a non-contrast MRI where we see again a thymic mass in the front of the chest marked with an M. This is a specific type of MRI that we call black blood, which can be done without contrast where the blood vessels show up as black. Several of the black blood vessels are labeled on this image. The white arrow shows an area where the mass extends into the superior vena cava labeled SVC. This is the main blood vessel draining blood into the heart from the upper body. Even without IV contrast, spread of tumor into the blood vessels can often be seen with MRI, which is very helpful in patients that are either allergic to CTIV contrast or who have poor kidney function. This is a clear advantage in these patients compared with CT. Finally, we're going to look at PET-CT. This is a highly specialized imaging study that obtains a regular CT scan first, generally without IV contrast. This is shown in the left image, which shows a thymic mass in the front of the chest marked with an M. Then a radioactively labeled substance called FDG is injected into the patient and a specialized imaging study called a PET scan is obtained. The injected FDG radio tracer is a sugar that's been changed and it is picked up by many parts of the body normally as well as by tumors and areas of infection or inflammation. The regular CT image and the PET image are then laid on top of one another and a combination scan is created, which is why we call it a PET CT scan. Fast growing tumors now show up as bright orange, such as the example image on the right. The pros of PET-CT imaging are that it can sometimes see areas of local or distant spread that are too small for CT scans to see since they now show up as bright orange. Additionally, when a tumor needs to be biopsied, the brighter orange areas will show the best area of the tumor to biopsy. Unfortunately, there are several cons to PET-CT imaging. In comparison to routine CT scans, PET-CTs have higher cost and higher radiation doses. There is also limited availability of PET-CT scanners in some locations. Long preparation times of approximately an hour and long scan times, which can approach an hour, are also a limitation of PET-CT. Finally, some thymic tumors do not pick up the PET-CT radio tracer and therefore they don't show up as bright orange on PET-CT scans. Conversely, sometimes non-cancer processes such as infection or inflammation can show up as orange on PET-CTs. So since PET-CTs can have these confusing results, specifically in thymic tumors, they're not routinely a part of imaging of thymic tumors. Finally, let's tie all this together in how imaging is most commonly used in thymic tumors. CT scans are by far the most common study done to diagnose and follow thymic tumors because they're easy to perform, they're widely available, and they're very good at evaluating the primary tumor, presence of local or distant spread, as well as evaluating if the tumor is smaller, the same, or bigger after treatment. CT is also very good at evaluating the chest after surgery to remove thymic tumors to see if they've returned, gotten worse, or spread. MRI scans are not routinely needed, but if there's a question specifically about local spread of tumor or in patients who cannot get CTIV contrast due to prior allergic reaction or poor kidney function, they can be very helpful. Finally, PET-CT is also not routinely used in imaging thymic tumors since many thymic tumors do not show up well on PET-CT studies, although it can be used in certain circumstances. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any further questions that you might have about imaging of thymic tumors. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is Dr. Jan Forden Thuisen, a histopathologist from Erasmus MC University Medical Center, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And the topic is, how should I understand my diagnosis? Dear viewers, my name is Jan van der Tuzen. I'm a thoracic pathologist at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And today I will attempt to provide a presentation in which I will go into the various components of the 
reports uh, of thymic epithelial tumors, which we produce as pathologists and which are used as a, a basis for the treatment and prognosis of patients. I will try to share my screen. I have nothing to disclose with respect to this presentation. So if we look at where thymic epithelial tumors occur in uh, the body, this is evidently in the area where normally the thymus would be located. And we can uh, divide the mediastinum, which contains the thymus, into a superior mediastinum, an anterior mediastinum, and a posterior mediastinum, as well as middle mediastinum, which uh, contains the heart mainly, uh, seen from the side, as well from the top, as well as from the uh, front of a patient. Um, and then if we locate the area where uh, thymic epithelial tumors such as thymomas arise, this is in the area where normally the thymus would be located. So slightly to the front and to the top of the heart, uh, whereas in other areas of the mediastinum, other tumors are far more common. So the normal thymus was first described already quite some time ago by Galen. Um, and the normal thymus is known to consist of different areas. So the outside layer is the so-called cortex, which is a very blue in this uh, hematoxylin and eosin stain here on the left-hand side, whereas the medulla, which contains a lot of epithelial cells, and we'll see that in a second, is actually central to this organ. Here we can see it in a, a close-up vision where we can see that these epithelial cells are actually quite evident in this uh, thymic tissue. So they have a lot of cytoplasm that are actually quite similar to the epithelial cells which cover the skin uh, in humans. Um, and in between these epithelial cells, we can see lots of these little cells with uh, very dark nuclei and these are the so-called lymphocytes. So the thymus is known to have a role in immune tolerance uh, and it reaches, in fact, its maximum weight in puberty. And after that, it undergoes involution. So uh, the thymic tissue, uh, which we can see here again with the medulla and the cortex, uh, eventually uh, almost uh, disappears in patients over the age of 50 and is replaced by fatty tissue. This is a normal physiological process. So the term thymoma uh, as um, an example of an epithelial uh, thymic tumor was first introduced by uh, uh, Mr. Grandhomme in, in 1900. And at that time, it was applied to all malignant tumors arising in the thymic gland, whereas this was later redefined by Dr. Bell, who first described tumors of the thymus that were associated with myasthenia gravis and used the term thymoma, meaning non-malignant tumors. So as with many of these sort of descriptions, the uh, truth is somewhere in the middle uh, and it's not very black and white, uh, but there's more of a grayscale. So there are some tumors which behave uh, in a very malignant fashion. Other tumors uh, do not uh, metastasize quite so readily, but there is not a single uh, epithelial tumor in the thymus, which does not have the potential to eventually metastasize and grow into neighboring organs. And this is important because a thymoma prognosis, on the one hand, is determined by the exact type of uh, the epithelial tumor that we're dealing with. Uh, so um, if you have a, a carcinoma, your survival is uh, probably uh, worse than uh, the patients who have a type A or a type AB thymoma. The other um, important aspect of uh, diagnosis of thymic epithelial tumors is the extent of disease. So to which extent these tumors are already grown into neighboring organs or potentially even metastasized at the time of diagnosis. So we can see here now that uh, thymic epithelial tumors do not form uh, just one disease, uh, but in fact, they need to be subcategorized um, according to histological subtype and extent of disease to provide a prognosis and also uh, therapeutic options. So in this context, it's important to understand what grading and staging means. So grading is described as a, uh, the description of a tumor based on how abnormal their cells are and the tumor tissue uh, under the microscope. It's an indicator of how quickly a tumor is likely to grow and spread. And this uh, is used in our, our classification of the different thymoma subtypes and also carcinomas of the thymus. <clears throat> 
whereas staging refers to the extent of your cancer, uh, such as how large the tumor is and if it has spread and grown into other organs. And this um, has a bearing on the eventual uh, follow-up of patients even after surgery, because some subtypes in combination uh, with uh, the staging parameters, such as in the Masaoka Koga staging or TNM classification, uh, have a combination which uh, should be treated with uh, post-operative radiotherapy, whereas other tumors can go into follow-up after surgery, particularly if the tumor has been completely removed, which you can see here. So grading is something that we do according to the WHO classification. Here is the 2015 book. Uh, this is soon to be replaced by the new classification and staging we do according to this manual. We're now in the eighth edition of the AJCC cancer staging manual. And we have various um, tools in our uh, toolbox as pathologists. So one is macroscopy. So we look at the resection specimen to see how far the tumor spread into the surrounding tissue, how large it is, whether it has been completely removed. We, of course, as pathologists, also look at tissue from these tumors under the microscope to determine which type it is. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to actually determine which type of epithelial tumor we're dealing with. In that case, we may need additional stains on these slides of tumor, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, in recent years, it's also become apparent that there are some specific mutations, not many, but some specific mutations uh, for uh, various subtypes, which could also aid in classification of these tumors. So to start off with the macroscopy, which happens in the grossing room in anatomy laboratories, uh, we look at the tumor in uh, relation to surrounding tissues, which have also sometimes been remo removed by the uh, surgeon. So if there is an intact capsule around the tumor, sometimes it's absent, but if there's no growth into the surrounding uh, fatty tissue, according to the Masaka Koga staging, we're dealing with the stage one. And you can see that here on the right. So this is a nicely demarcated uh, tumor with no invasion into the surrounding fat. Um, if there is obvious macroscopic invasion into the fat, we call it a stage 2A. If this um, invasion is macroscopically present, so stage 2A is microscopic invasion. If it's macroscopically present, so we can already see that in the grossing room, it's a stage 2B. And that's seen here where we can see that this tumor actually extends into the surrounding fatty tissue and there's no evident capsule surrounding it. Uh, this is another uh, example of a, a stage 2B with quite extensive invasion into uh, the fat, as we just saw in that, mic in that uh, photograph. A stage 3 uh, means that the tumor is actually invading into surrounding tissues, such as the pleura of the lung or perhaps the pericardium. And you can see that that is more extensive here on the right. It's still the stage 3 according to the Masaka Koga staging. Then stage four uh, means that there are already some local metastases, such as on the pericardium or in the pleura. And stage four B means that there is distant uh, metastatic spread. Um, so this is one staging system that we commonly use, the Masoko Koga uh, staging system, but the TNM classification is another one, uh, and that's actually more common also in other uh, types of tumor in the body. And this is something that is now uh, preferred in many centers as a a staging system, which can then also be translated into clinical stages, as you can see here. And these have implications for further therapy of the patient. Uh, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, the extent to which a tumor has been completely removed is very important because if, uh, as we call it, an R plus disease is present, so the patient uh, has still some tumor remaining uh, inside the mediastinum, uh, these uh, patients tend to have uh, a poorer uh, cumulative survival. So microscopy is very important in determining which exact tumor type we're dealing with, uh, and that's done by cutting slides and staining those with, uh, in this case, a hematoxylin and eosin stain. Uh, and again, the uh, WHO book is important in providing the various subtypes that we can classify into. So here we have the various subtypes here at the top, we see a type A thymoma with these spindly cells. 
at the top right, there's an AB thymoma with spindly cells and also some uh, lymphocytes in between. Then uh, we see an area in which a tumor uh, is completely composed, I mean, morphologically under the microscope of a thymocyte, so of these uh, lymphocytes, but there are some epithelial cells in between which are very difficult to observe. For that, we may need additional stains. We'll see that in a second. Uh, and this is a type B, where these epithelial cells become much more common. And type B3, in which the epithelial cells are uh, predominant and they also have uh, slightly abnormal nuclei. And then eventually, uh, this is a thymic carcinoma, where the tumor cells are virtually indistinguishable from carcinomas in other organs. So again, this is a type A, with these spindly cells, bland-looking cells, B1, uh, with lots of lymphocytes, uh, B2 with lymphocytes and a few epithelial cells, uh, AB with intermingled epithelial cells and uh, lymphocytes, and then there's a B3 with larger cells, larger nuclei, so these nuclei inside these cells become enlarged and atypical, and then there's a thymic carcinoma with evidently atypical epithelial cells. So sometimes it's difficult to distinguish, particularly the different B types of thymoma. We may need additional immunohistochemical stains, such as, for instance, pancarotin, which is an epithelial marker. So you can delineate all of the epithelial cells lying underneath all of the, the uh, thymocytes, so the lymphocytes that we saw in the H&E stain. You can see here there's the typical pattern of the A. Here's an AB type pattern, B1, B2, and B3. So this can actually be very useful in distinguishing these different subtypes. Uh, and it may also be necessary to uh, determine whether we're actually dealing with normal thymocytes, so lymphocytes which express a TDT, which normally happens in the uh, thymus. And then lastly, molecular diagnostics have, has taken off in the last few years, uh, particularly uh, in other uh, tumor types in the thorax, uh, for instance, in lung cancer. Um, uh, and in the thymus, it is now also proving some additional advantage in actually being able to classify these different uh, tumor types. So the type A uh, thymic epithelial tumors, uh, thymomas tend to have uh, a GTF2I mutation, whereas, for instance, uh, carcinomas uh, have abnormalities of the P53 pathway. So by using these various molecular classifiers, you can actually uh, also try to delineate different clusters and thereby aid a specific diagnosis. And here we can see that there is not a... Uh, um, a an evident, uh, completely distinctive uh, marker, unfortunately yet, but GTF2A uh, may be quite useful in differential diagnosis. So this is something that we can determine with uh, sequencing efforts in uh, this type of tumor. Um, and that may be useful, for instance, for distinguishing type A from type three from carcinomas, which can look quite similar uh, and which then have uh, different uh, mutations. So thymoma type A, for instance, it tends to have few genomic alterations. These mentioned GTF2A mutations, and in contrast with thymic carcinoma, uh, no P53 mutations, for instance. So once we have all this information, uh, and it is quite a lot of information, we try to compile a report, which may be a narrative report, but increasingly laboratories are now using pro forma uh, reporting sheets in which all of these different details can be, can be entered. So including the tumor type, as well as the resection margins, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the actual invasion into surrounding structures. So all of these various different components that we've discussed today will be present in the report. Uh, and this report then goes to the multidisciplinary team. And here we can actually see a multidisciplinary team in action at the Mayo Clinic. And this is uh, one of my dear colleagues, uh, Anya Roden, uh, in the driving seat at the microscope. And, in these sort of settings, uh, the outcomes of a particular resection specimen are discussed to then uh, mutually and together uh, decide on the uh, appropriate course of action for this patient. And uh, in that um, sequence, we can then eventually generate uh, an advice in the outpatient clinic as to the follow-up uh, for this patient. So that's our role in the diagnosis of thymic epithelial tumors. I hope uh, that uh, it has been 
a relatively clear presentation. And of course, I'm very happy uh, to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank both speakers for your presentations. I'm sorry that due to my problems, one of this presentation was disrupted. Um, I can see some, uh, some questions here. Um, how often are tumors of mixed cell histology and uh, um, can the cell histology change over time? Jan, what is in your experience? Yes, I think that, that is a very good question. Uh, thank you, Margaret. And, and to uh, um, I think it was Ruth who asked the, yeah, the question, Ruth. yes. Um, this is something that, that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with as well, Margaret. And in, in many of our, our uh, um, specimens, uh, we see different cell types. So it can be quite difficult to actually uh, make the overall diagnosis uh, if you don't sample the tumor uh, correctly. So I think um, we know now that these tumors tend to be heterogeneous. So some areas of the tumor will contain a particular cell type and in other tumors, there will be another uh, cell type. And yes, uh, they can be quite often mixed. So one of the, the categories that I mentioned is that the type AB thymoma in which we see some parts which can be A, other parts can be a, a type B or a B2, uh, and then we can still call it a, a type AB. And this is something that in recent years actually has been recognized more and more uh, by pathologists, and this is a, uh, a diagnosis which, which we are including more and more in our reports as well. So yes, yeah. uh, many tumors are of mixed uh, cell histology. Uh, can their histology change over time? And they tend to stay relatively true to their original uh, differentiation. Uh, we sometimes see progression of tumor to a, a higher uh, grade, but on the whole, uh, if we see um, a um, a tumor which recurs, for instance, in the area where the, the patient has been operated, it tends to be of the same type of tumor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree. I can confirm um, the tumors very often have uh, mixed morphology uh, and some uh, types, of course, so we, we don't need to talk about AB type, which is uh, per definition a uh, mixed type but also, for instance, B2 and B3 thymomas very often uh, coexist together. And, um, um, but if the tumor relapse, we uh, sometimes observe that, uh, for instance, at the, in a primary tumor, one component predominated, but, uh, but in relapse, another component predominates. Sometimes after treatment, morphology looks a little bit differently. But generally speaking, these are all this, uh, all the time, the same tumors, but morphology may be may be very uh, mixed. That's uh, uh, that's why, from very small biopsy, if the tumor was biopsied before surgery, uh, very often pathologists even don't try to subtype the tumor because the sub um, this uh, can be. Uh, not uh, um, uh, not related to the whole tumor after resection, because very small biopsy may not represent the the whole tumor. Um, do thymic tumors utilize energy differently based on type? That's very uh, very interesting question. I think Chad, this is the question uh, about PET CT uh, rather. Have you observed such differences in, um, do we have a chat with us? Chat Strange? Good morning. Oh. Well, I good morning. Say. Good morning from Houston. I assume it's afternoon where most of you are. Okay. So have you observed the difference uh, in um, PET CT uh, depending on the histological subtype of thymic tumor? And the bottom line is yes. And so th that is one of the issues with PET-CT, um, with thymic tumors. A lot of the lower grade lesions do not take up the radio tracer. So they're, you know, not, that we talked about that bright orange, they're not very avid, but the more aggressive, more invasive tumors do tend to be. And so on the lower grade tumors, PET-CT is not as helpful 
where on the higher grade tumors, it tends to be more helpful just because of that. They take up the radio tracer more as their higher grade tumor. So that is, that is definitely true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But have you observed such a relationship um, uh, with the number of lymphocytes? I mean, there are tumors, th thymomas, rich in lymphocytes and thymomas poor in lymphocytes. And uh, um, have you observed such a relationship with uh, this uh, lymphocytic non-neoplastic component and uh, PET CT results? I don't know that specifically with that, that I've noticed that different, uh, that, that correlation. I can see. Okay, thank you. There is uh, another question, I think, also to you. Uh, if uh, you've had a thymoma removed surgically via sternotomy, have had clear margins, clear CT scans each year, and are approaching 10 years post-thymectomy, would you still suggest yearly follow-up with CT scans to ensure the chest remains clear? So, I mean, that's a great question. And obviously I do not want to get between you and your surgeon, you and your doctor that, you know, that's, that it would be your decision. But I would say if you've had 10 years of follow-up, the chest is clear at 10 years, certainly it would be a, a good discussion to have with your physician. Could we start you know, lengthening that out to every two years, every three years? Um, I, I certainly think with 10 years clear, that yearly follow-up maybe may not be as needed. So I think that would be a very good discussion to have at 10 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, uh, we don't uh, have uh, clinicians with us today, I'm afraid, uh, but it is a good question to, to them. Um, if such a um, follow-up every year, every is needed. However, yeah. on the other hand, uh, in my institution, I observed a relapse after 15, 20 years from primary tumors. So uh, observation, generally speaking, should be really very long, in my opinion. Right. Uh, here I have, um, uh, we have a very general question, maybe you, maybe Jan would like to comment. Uh, any information on inoperable, uh, inoperable tumors? It's a very general question. Uh, um, I'm not sure how we could, um, how we could uh, um, follow this question. Perhaps this question would be better for uh, medical oncologists or maybe for surgeons. Uh, so maybe we should uh, ask this question uh, during our next webinars to clinicians. And here is another question. Um, my question is about glucose, glutamine uptake, etc., energy utilization. Okay, so it was it was uh, associated with PET CT. Uh, this question about uh, about energy utilization um, by by the tumor. Um, okay, if thymoma is suspected on CT scan. Is it customary to do a blood test for myasthenia gravis prior to surgery so a thymectomy can be done when, when the thymoma is removed? I guess a question is if uh, tests uh, uh, for myasthenia gravis are performed uh, routinely before each thymectomy when thymoma is suspected. Uh, it's, I think it's also rather the question to clinicians, but uh, um, I observed in my institution when I uh, received the tumor, because I'm a pathologist, when I received the tumor after resection, I very often read clinical data before the surgery. And uh, almost in all uh, cases, uh, I, I see the information about neurological uh, tests before surgery. Jan, what about your, um, what is your observation? Yes, I think, I, I think that's often the case. I think, I think uh, part of the workup is uh, looking for um, evidence of my gravis, but I think if, if the question is, does that influence the extent of your surgery? I think on the whole, it probably does not because we always receive the complete thymectomy specimen if possible. Right? So the entire thymus gets taken out, including the tumor. Uh, so I think that, that already um, is the, the optimal treatment for the, uh, the myasthenia gravis. Mm -hmm. 
By the way, Chad, uh, are there any recommendations uh, for uh, patients with myasthenia gravis in terms of uh, um, imaging? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of uh, contrast and so on, if patient has uh, myasthenia gravis, any special recommendations for them? Well, I think just as he was saying, I think, you know, most patients who have known myasthenia gravis are going to receive chest, you know, a chest CT with contrast to look for thymic tumors. And conversely, the patients who have thymic tumors, I think just as a part of their workup are generally going to be screened for myasthenia. I think that, that those most of the time just go together. So certainly patients with myasthenia the vast majority of them are going to get a CT of the chest with contrast to look at, you know, to look for any kind of thymic tumor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here is a comment rather than a question uh, um, written by uh, Jen Jenny. I'm allergic to CT contrast, so uh, should I get MRI? Um, so I, I think it's uh, in accordance with uh, that uh, you told before about um, people who are allergic to CT contrast very often uh, don't have problems with uh, uh, with MRI. Right. And a lot of, you know, a lot of even in patients who are allergic to CT contrast, often you can give a a, a preparation of medicines with steroids and Benadryl and you can still do the CT with contrast. And, and also, we do a lot of um, thymectomy follow-up scans without contrast. And so just because you can't get the, the CT contrast, you can still do a CT without contrast. And generally, you can still look at the thyroid bed and see, is there, you know, is there any tumor that's still there, any tumor that's coming back? So often, CT is still very adequate for that. And then conversely, sometimes you can give the steroids and still give contrast. And then if none of those work, then MRI can be done um, with or without contrast. And so there are actually, there are several options, even in patients who are allergic to contrast. Okay, thank you. Um, here is a question rather about pathophysiology, I think. Do you have any understanding of what makes a thymic mass initially grow and what sustains its growth? Uh, Jan, would you like to comment on it? Yes, that's a, an excellent question again. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by thymic mass, because of course there are also non, as we call them, neoplastic thymic uh, uh, tumors. So uh, if you uh, look at the spectrum of abnormalities that we can find in the, in the thymus, um, you might also think of hyperplasia, which by itself is not um, a malignancy, um, which is a sort of a hyperactive thymic tissue. So, so there are stimuli which, which can actually lead the thymus to enlarge, um, but it doesn't become a, a growth of its own. It's still under the influence of, of various factors of the body. So what I discussed in the, uh, the, uh, the last slide of my presentation are the uh, abnormalities in the DNA of the tumor. So that is the information which is contained and the cells which make up the tumor. Uh, and this, once that happens, so you get actually get abnormalities in the DNA, uh, cells can then proliferate independent of other factors in the body. And then they can form this mass which can actually outgrow uh, the normal confinements of, of the thymus and grow into other organs and, and also spread. So I think these are, are two different uh, ways in which thymic masses can actually grow. Uh, and what we're discussing today is mainly the latter, in which, of course, a tumor has been diagnosed as a, a malignancy, and that's due to abnormalities in the DNA of the, the mm -hmm. tumor cells. Mm -hmm. uh, now I can see the question about uh, biopsy. In case uh, where a biopsy is performed, uh, say because the tumor is inoperable, inoperable how do you make sure such a biopsy takes a representative sample of the tumor? Uh, what should patients ask about biopsies? Jan? <laughs> I think that's both a question for the pathologist and the radiologist, because um, it, it would be prudent to uh, take a biopsy which is guided by the findings in radiology. So I could imagine that, uh, for instance, Dr. Strange uh, sees an area of the tumor which is high uh, in uptake in the, in the PET-CT scan, uh, 
that, that would be an area which you would be most interested in because that could potentially be the highest grade of tumor which could determine your outcome and treatment. And, and that's exactly right. I mean, you know, when you think about a smaller tumor that's one or two centimeters, it, it's probably not going to matter. The needle's going to be in the middle of it. But especially when lar with larger tumors where, you know, where the interventional radiologist or surgeon can guide where they biopsy, we can use PET CT findings, you know, the areas that are the most metabolically active or the brightest orange. Um, and we can use MRI areas that are the most enhancing um, to guide the biopsy so that they're getting, you know, hopefully the most aggressive part of the tumor um, for the for the grading and staging. So we definitely help our interventionalist with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I can see another um, very interesting question, very important question, I think. Um, my biopsy showed a B1 thymoma encapsulated, but if they only biopsied a small part of a tumor, will that be accurate? Uh, are all thymoma considered cancerous or only C-type? I have been told I had a cancer by one doctor and then told I didn't had, uh, have cancer by another doctor. I am confused. Jan, would you like to comment on, the, the, uh, on it? Yes, I, I, I fully agree. It is, it is confusing, uh, Shona, and I, I can imagine that, that you felt uh, confused uh, because as I tried to explain in one of my slides, um, it isn't black and white. So what we know from other organs is that you have benign tumors and then you have malignant counterpart of, of these tumors, uh, which, which only those have the, the ability to metastasize and grow into other organs. That's not the case for thymoma. So even uh, a type A thymoma or a type B thymoma, uh, they can uh, metastasize and they can also grow into other organs. So there is, on the thymoma spectrum, there isn't a single entity which doesn't have uh, that uh, potential to actually cause that type of damage. Um, now, some of them will have less of a potential uh, to, to metastasize, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, you have, for instance, a type B3 thymoma, which tends to have a, a worse outcome, and then going from the type B3 to the carcinoma, uh, where the carcinoma has probably an even worse outcome. And so I think it's a spectrum uh, that we're dealing with, and, and it's very difficult to say where you would draw the line, actually call something a cancer, uh, but I think it, it's safe to say that none of these lesions are benign. I think that's that's how you perhaps should approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, this confusion is, uh, mm, the reason of this confusion um, is uh, because uh, during the years in the past, classifications and thinking about thymomas um, was, uh, has been changed. Uh, for a certain time, you also showed this in your presentation, for a certain time, uh, some thymomas were regarded as benign tumors. Of course, now we know that all subtypes are um, malignant because all of them can metastasize, can relapse, but for a certain time, some thymomas were considered as benign. And also names, names of these subtypes uh, were, were um, changed. For instance, uh, um, 15 years ago, we used such a name, well-differentiated thymic carcinoma. Now we use a name, thymoma B3. Uh, on the other hand, um, there was a classification when uh, thymoma C were diagnosed. Currently, we name them thymic carcinomas. So unfortunately, because of these changes in classifications, this can be really confusing not only for patients but also for physicians frankly speaking and especially if someone is interested in the topic and serve the literature all the all the literature it may be confusing really confusing to translate all these names from one classification to the, to the other so this is, I think this is, uh, this, it can be a problem. I can observe it is a problem also for our colleagues, not only for patients. Another question, do CT scans increase my risk of tumors after a sternotomy removal due to radiation? Chad, qu very question, very good question to you. Yeah, it's a, and, and actually at the first, there are several questions about radiation. So I may yeah. go through a couple of those. 
Um, short answer, no. I mean, get the, the radiation involved in a CT scan is not going to make the tumor worse, make it grow faster, make it spread more. So in that sense, I would not have any fear of getting a CT on the effect on the tumor. And the reality is, is, you know, CT scans do give radiation. There's no, I mean, that, that's just a fact. However, over the last, especially 10 to 15 years, there've been significant improvements in CT scanners, how they work, how they acquire their, their data, their images, so that the radiation doses on CT scans have significantly gone down. And so the, the doses now are really, they're much more manageable than they have been. And so like one of the questions was, you know, because of CT scans and radiation, are there ways to follow this without radiation? That would be an MRI. You know, the downside is an MRI can take up to an hour to perform. So CT scans are very fast. They're much cheaper. And so generally CT is the way to go and the radiation doses are not too bad, but it is real. Um, there, was, there was a question, is there a limit on the number of CT scans that you can get in your lifetime? And the answer is no. I mean, obviously you want, I mean, fewer is better. Um, the younger you are, the more it's an issue. So certainly in children, teenagers were much more concerned about it. Um, in women of childbearing age, breast tissue seems to be a little bit more sensitive to radiation. So certainly in children, teenagers, and young women, we're more cautious. And so we would more consider an MRI. Um, but but there's certainly not a limit. There was also a question about protective coverings for CT. In the past, it was very, very common to use thyroid shields that cover the thyroid or breast shields that covered, you know, the chest of women um, or sometimes pelvic shields that would cover the ovaries. The reality is, is that does decrease the quality of the CT and there's really not any significant data to show that that is that helpful. So it is still done in some places, but honestly, not very often. The doses in general have gone down so far that people really do not worry about the protective coverings as much just because the doses are a lot lower. So the radiation is real, but honestly, with newer scanners, it is, it is not that big of a concern, um, especially once you're out of the children, you know, teenager, young adult years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the question, Jan, rather to you, I think, uh, also the timing genetic work is relatively new. Is there any work being done or considered utilizing gene editing with thymic tumors? Um, not that I have come across. I don't know whether you, you've, uh, you have any experience with that, uh, Margaret. I, I don't think that's something that, that we've seen yet um, being uh, prepared for clinical practice. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I mean, in, in research settings, yes, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, some, some research groups would uh, perhaps take tumor tissue and then actually uh, try to uh, edit the genes in, in a Petri dish or, uh, you know, after uh, uh, using that tissue to, to grow up uh, additional tumors in, in the lab, but not in patients, I don't think. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, current uh, genetic analysis on uh, thymic tumors show that uh, um, gene abnormalities are not uh, so common as, for instance, in, let's say, lung carcinoma. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, at this moment, uh, um, uh, we can't base the treatment on, on, on these uh, on, on these mutations that are found in, in thymic tumors. Um, the most, uh, I think, uh, for now, the most useful mutation is uh, GTF2I uh, mutation, but it is rather for diagnostic purpose rather than for, for the treatment for now. Uh, and think, uh, yes. sorry, Margaret. Yeah, I think I think yeah. I think the problem also is that that we haven't identified any real driver mutations, as we call yeah. them, as we know them from the lung cancer field, uh, which are known to make the tumor addictive to that particular mutation for their growth. So if you can actually then uh, try to inhibit that particular uh, protein, which is encoded by that, uh, by that gene, which is, which is mutated, you can try to 
uh, inhibit tumor growth as well, and we haven't identified any of those in uh, thymoma. There are some pa papers about uh, mutations in uh, SECIT gene, and uh, um, in these patients, uh, um, uh, inhibitors for this uh, particular um, kinase were uh, were tested uh, with with different results so but uh, um, these papers are not very um, there are only few uh, information um, about this um, this kind of treatment and another question is my pathology in my pathology report there was a k67 of 95 percent what does uh, what does it mean would you like to comment on it? <laughs> yeah, so, so in, uh, in general terms, uh, as pathologists, we use KI67 or MIB1, as it's sometimes also called, as, as an adjunct to the uh, assessment that we do under the microscope. So this is one of these ancillary techniques that I talked about. So it's an immunohistochemical stain. Uh, and the higher the KI67 is, the more uh, of these tumor cells are actually proliferating. So the more of them are dividing uh, and causing growth of the tumor. So and a KI67 of 95% means that uh, almost all of the tumor cells will be uh, proliferating at the, at the time uh, when the biopsy was taken or the, uh, the, the tumor was removed. Now, it depends on which tumor type uh, this was done in as to what the meaning of this would be. Uh, because, for instance, if uh, you're talking about a neuroendocrine th tumor, which is also an epithelial tumor of the, uh, of the thymus, uh, this would mean that would uh, probably imply that you're uh, in the high-grade uh, carcinoma uh, type. Um, but um, in other tumors, so for instance, a, a, a lymphocytic tumor, uh, that might have completely different implications. So it's difficult to, to say from just the KI67 what that means for a particular tumor or, or, yeah. or the, uh, the patient in question. Yeah, exactly, because we don't know what tumor was analyzed in this case. And very often in uh, lymphocyte-rich th thymomas, uh, AB for instance, AB thymomas, uh, they show K67 almost 100%, but this is a proliferation index of non-neoplastic lymphocyte not actually neoplastic cells. So it's everything depends on the, on, on the kind of, um, of tumor. Um, next question is about uh, immunotherapy, about uh, chemotherapy and treatment. So I suggest to leave this question for uh, our next webinars. Uh, another question, are mammograms still necessary if following a thymoma with chest CTs? Chat, it's rather for you a question. So if I'm understanding that about mammograms, um, so, I mean, you know, mammogram is a test to screen for breast cancer. Yeah. And when we talk about any screening test, whether it's for breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, you know, you're combining the, the data. Are you within the parameters for screening? And is life expectancy such that screening makes sense? And so, you know, should you still get mammograms while you're being followed for a thymoma? I mean, if if you're in the screening age and your thymoma has been removed and you're tumor free, yes, you should still get mammograms. Um, if you know if you had a stage four thymoma, you know that is spread to several places, you're not a surgical candidate. You know, eh, you may not you may not need to mess with mammograms. So it very much depends on where you are in the treatment, the tumor that you have, you know, age, whether mammograms would still be something that you should still be pursuing. And that's something you could talk about with your clinician to, to make that decision. Okay. And the last question is, uh, is very similar to that you, uh, you responded. Do we know uh, long-term effects yet from years of CT scans considering with thymomas and the recommendations with years of uh, follow-up through scanning? Um, would you like to add anything? Sure. I mean, you know, basically the question is, do we know the long-term effects of CT? CT scans became, you know, they were invented in the 70s. By the 1990s, I mean, CT scanners were in every hospital, every ER, um, and I think probably more in the United States than in Europe, but, you know, CT, but everywhere, CT usage has skyrocketed since the 1990s. 
So when we look at long-term effects of radiation from CT, we now have data for 30, 40 years where CT scans have been very highly used. And the reality is in the vast majority of cancers, we have not seen an increase in cancer rate that can be attributed to CT scans. And so this is not a study we can do. I mean, you can't just study to see, you know, if lots of CTs causes cancer. But when we look at the data retrospective, when we look back, we really don't see an increase in cancer related to CT scanners. So again, it is probably the long term data probably says they are safer than we think they are as regards to radiation. We still try to use as little radiation as possible, as few scans as possible, but probably they are not causing cancer in a way that I think we, we feared they might 20 or 30 years ago. I can con uh, confirm uh, because uh, um, during my years of work in this institution, we observe a lot of patients. Uh, the patients come back um, uh, because of uh, different reasons. I never found a case, I never met a case uh, with uh, any complications, a secondary tumor that could be potentially caused by um, repetitive CTs or something like that. Uh, never, frankly speaking. So, May, uh, may I add a comment? Uh, uh, this is Dr. Uh, yes, Biran from, from Tel Aviv. May I add a comment? Yes, please. My comment is that uh, thymomas by themselves are associated with the increased risk of secondary tumors. And this risk is probably, there is no study uh, f uh, designed for that, but the, the, the risk, the biological risk is probably higher than that associated uh, with just with the uh, radiography. I mean the the uh, city exposure. You mean that this uh, uh, additional tumor could be uh, caused by uh, exposure? No, no, uh, no, no. The opposite. The the thymoma itself is associated with a greater greater risk for a second primary tumors. Yes, 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 that's right. Uh, we can find such information in, um, um, and a lot of studies um, uh, in the right feature. Secondary tumors uh, were um, described uh, before, uh, simultaneously or after thymomas or thymic tumors. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, it's time to um, to finish to close our webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, the speakers. Thank you, the audience. Uh, again, I'm very sorry for this technical uh, unexpected uh, issues during our webinar. And uh, of course, I would like to invite you for our second webinar um, um, on nearest uh, nearest Monday. Uh, on March 29th, uh, Dr. Paul Van Schiel will talk about surgical aspects, surgical techniques, techniques uh, associated with the uh, um, treatment of uh, thymic tumors. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, um, um, uh, audience. Thank you, Pam, for um, um, hosting this meeting. And uh, let me invite you for our next webinars um, soon. Thank you very much.